in the midst of Northwest England's criminal underworld, a series of violent episodes unfolded, tracing back to a seemingly trivial dispute in a Manchester nightclub where a drink was flung by one criminal at another group. The catalyst for this violent spiral was a deceitful transaction involving a counterfeit Breitling watch. This incident ignited a relentless cycle of violence that spanned four years, including two homicides, an array of shootings and revenge-driven assaults echoing the tumultuous Gunchester era of the 1990s. Central to this wave of aggression was Mark Fellows, known as the Iceman for his chilling composure, who played a pivotal role in the perpetration of these violent acts. His actions led to his conviction and a whole life sentence, marking him as one of the rare individuals in England and Wales to be subjected to such a severe penalty. Fellows was found guilty of the brutal murders of Paul Massey and John Kinsella, key figures in the criminal landscape. Massey, a figure of notoriety from Manchester's rave scene in the 1990s, had retained his prominence in Salford despite his murky dealings. His murder in July 2015 by Fellows, who unleashed a barrage of 18 bullets from an Uzi submachine gun, was a stark indicator of the escalating conflict. Kinsella, equally commanding respect and fear, met a similar fate three years later. Notably, Kinsella had once intervened to prevent a gangster from harming former England footballer Stephen Gerrard, earning him a formidable reputation as an enforcer in Merseyside. Welcome to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel, where I unravel the veiled tales of cryptic crimes. The grim saga surrounding the unresolved slayings of Massey and Kinsella loomed over the Greater Manchester Police for years, shadowing them with a complex mystery and a staggering list of 112 potential suspects drawn from the depths of the Salford criminal milieu. The vast network of individuals under suspicion underscored the daunting task detectives faced, compounded by a public too intimidated to break their silence for fear of retribution. In the midst of this tense atmosphere, Kinsella's role as a pallbearer at Massey's funeral stood as a poignant symbol of the close-knit and complex relationships within this shadowy world. Massey, known widely as Mr Big within the Manchester area, had long been a prominent figure. His moniker, Salford's Mr Big, was coined during a contentious council meeting in 1992, where he was accused of instigating civil unrest within the city. Despite the police's keen interest in apprehending him, Massey earned a measure of respect in certain circles, notably for his staunch opposition to heroin, a stance he made public through warning stickers placed on lampposts throughout Salford. By April 2015, in the wake of four violent incidents that shook the community, including two shootings and separate assaults with a machete and a grenade, rumours swirled around Massey's alleged role as a peacemaker. Despite his denial of police requests for mediation, a former associate told British media that Massey's murder was a direct result of his attempts to broker peace between the warring factions, a scenario that saw him increasingly caught in the crossfire. Police theories suggest Massey's alignment with one of the feuding groups, known as the A-Team, inadvertently marked him for death by their adversaries, the Anti-A-Team, culminating in a tragic end to his attempts at quelling the violence. On the evening of July 26, 2015, at 7.23pm, the serenity of the outskirts of Manchester, England was shattered. Paul Massey, having just returned from a sojourn at Winkup's holiday camp by the Irish Sea in North Wales, parked his silver BMW 5 Series outside a Bargham liquor store. His break, intended for relaxation, was anything but restful, burdened as he was by the constant buzzing of two mobile phones, with numerous individuals seeking his counsel. Massey's visit to the store was brief, he made his usual purchase of a bottle of Bacardi and two litres of Coke, leaving a tip for the cashier with his change, and departed within a minute. An ominous figure followed him, trailing just 17 seconds behind. Massey's afternoon prior to this had been spent in the company of two gang members, after which he visited a bookmaker, procured Bacardi and Cokes, and then returned to his home, a spacious red brick colonial house set back from a bustling road, secured behind wrought iron gates. Unknown to Massey, his movements had been monitored, alerting an assailant who lay in wait. At 7.27pm, as he got out of his car, a tall, athletic figure, disguised with a fake beard and clad in combat gear, crossed the road towards him. With calculated swiftness, the assailant pulled out an Uzi and opened fire. This tragic ambush was something Massey had long contemplated. In a BBC interview in the late 1990s, he had somberly acknowledged the perilous nature of his existence, remarking, If it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen. I am aware of the risks involved. In the driveway, a moment of abrupt violence ensued for Massey, 
as a bullet struck his left shin, causing bone fragments to scatter across the gravel, a testament to the brutality of the attack. Amidst the ensuing chaos, his grip on the Bacardi bottle loosened, sending it crashing to the ground where it shattered. To compound the horror, another bullet ravaged his right hand, severing one of his fingers entirely. Yet despite these grievous wounds, Massey sought refuge behind some refuse bins, hastily dialing 999 in a desperate plea for assistance. The assailant, emboldened, continued his barrage towards Massey's makeshift cover. Of the 18 bullets discharged, one was particularly lethal, breaching Massey's fifth rib, ravaging through his chest and wreaking havoc on vital organs. As Massey lay bleeding, the perpetrator made a swift retreat across the street, through the graveyard of St Anne's Parish Church, and vanished into the shadows of a nearby wooded area. In a scene reminiscent of cinematic gangster epics, the attacker mounted a bicycle and pedalled away, leaving behind a scene of carnage and a community in shock. This daring escape became the focus of British tabloids, drawing parallels with the likes of Peaky Blinders and The Sopranos, captivating a nation with its audacity and mystery. Despite the identification of over 100 persons of interest, the case languished, unsolved. Understanding the complex fabric of this saga demands an appreciation of the Salford Code, a doctrine embodied in two simple yet profound words, don't snitch. On the 5th of May 2018, a chilling episode unfolded on a secluded rural lane near Junction 7 of the M62 at Rainhill, where John Kinsella, a father of two, was walking his American Bulldogs, accompanied by his pregnant partner, Wendy Owen. Their tranquility was shattered when a masked individual, cleverly disguised in a high visibility vest and riding a mountain bike, approached them from behind. Without warning, the gunman shot Kinsella twice in the back, causing him to fall instantly. Owen witnessed the attacker, whom she identified as the Iceman, coldly advance on her fallen partner and deliver two final fatal shots to the back of his head at point-blank range. The investigation into Kinsella's murder led detectives to a piece of CCTV footage. Although it didn't capture the murder itself, it showed a man on a bicycle heading towards Kinsella's home around 5am. The cyclist's face was hidden, yet his build bore a marked resemblance to Mark Fellow's. This sighting led to Fellow's arrest on May 30th, 2018, as he landed at Manchester Airport from Amsterdam on an EasyJet flight, under suspicion for both Kinsella's and Massey's murders. Despite being taken in for questioning, Fellow's chose to remain silent throughout the police interviews. In the hours following the murder, Fellow's seemingly attempted to maintain a veneer of normalcy, spending time with his mother at the Trafford Centre, where they dined at the Zizi restaurant, and he purchased a pair of stylish pound 165 mallet trainers from Tasuti. His day continued with socialising with friends at a pub and enjoying a meal at KFC, before jetting off to Amsterdam for a holiday shortly afterwards. Despite the gravity of the allegations against him, Mark Fellows did not exhibit any signs of perturbation post the suspected murders. Known to law enforcement as a member of the anti-A team, Fellows had previously drawn attention when he suffered a gunshot wound to the buttocks shortly following Massey's killing, though he had not been apprehended at that time. His criminal record, featuring five convictions for a range of offences including robbery and illegal possession of ammunition, did not suggest a propensity for contract killing. Fellows was distinctive in appearance, possessing a square jawline and a lean frame more akin to a runner than a hitman betraying his Salford roots with an unremarkable low-profile lifestyle. Hindered by a childhood illness, he necessitated the use of a colostomy bag and was particularly attentive to his personal hygiene and health. A father to two young children, Fellows worked night shifts as a sous chef, honing his expertise in sauce preparation for a manufacturer of chilled and frozen foods. Although concrete evidence tying Fellows to the murders was elusive, police did uncover a smartphone in his possession that raised eyebrows. This phone had been modified to enter an encrypted mode with a simple press of the power and volume buttons, a feature not illegal, yet curious to detectives who speculated its use in concealing illicit communications, potentially indicative of a hitman coordinating with a lookout. This suspicion gained traction when Stephen Boyle, a known associate and purported ally of Fellows, was apprehended. Boyle was implicated in shadowing Massey by car after his visit to the Bargain Booze in 2015, and was believed to have signalled Fellows at the opportune moment to strike Kinsella and his dogs in 2018. Like Fellows, Boyle, age 35, had a record of minor convictions. His arrest outside Manchester at a hotel marked the moment when Boyle decided to break his silence, 
potentially opening a new chapter in the investigation into the two high-profile killings. Stephen Boyle's startling admission hinted at a deeper involvement in the crimes than previously suspected, yet his words alone were insufficient for the police to make their case. They sought tangible evidence, a mission that led them to the doorstep of Mark Fellow's residence, where they conducted a thorough search. The investigators did not uncover the bicycle seen in the CCTV footage, nor did they find any weapon linked to the killings. However, they stumbled upon a seemingly innocuous item that, combined with information from an indiscreet gang member, began to unravel the mysteries behind both murders, a Garmin forerunner, 10 GPS watch. Fellows, an avid long-distance runner, depended on his Garmin forerunner 10 GPS watch, not just for personal fitness tracking, but, as it turned out, for far more sinister purposes. His prowess in running was notable. He had recently completed a 10K run at the Great Manchester Run, with a commendable time of 47 minutes. Race photographs showed him, dishevelled and determined, crossing the finish line with the Garmin watch securely fastened to his left wrist. It was the data extracted from this watch that provided a breakthrough for investigators. Fellows had been meticulous in using the device to log his running sessions, including his participation in the Manchester 10K, yet the watch had also been used to record a series of reconnaissance missions. Remarkably, Fellows had the presence of mind not to wear the watch during the actual execution of the murders. One particular outing, three months before Massey's assassination, proved to be especially incriminating. Fellows had travelled from his home in Salford to a field opposite Massey's residence. The GPS data showed speeds consistent with cycling, not running, and revealed a deliberate stop in tracking near a small stone church, a location strategically chosen for its proximity to Massey's home. Fellow spent eight minutes there, presumably mapping out his approach and getaway routes, with the watch capturing every move until he manually stopped the recording. The trial that ensued was marked by an unprecedented level of security, surpassing anything the prosecutors had previously encountered. At Liverpool Crown Court, measures were strictly enforced to ensure the jury's anonymity, including a ban on photographing jurors and the use of mobile phones within the courtroom, over the six weeks of proceedings, the prosecution presented their case that Fellows had been contracted for the assassinations of both Massey and Kinsella, with Boyle playing a supporting role as his accomplice on each occasion. In a strategic move, Fellows' defence team opted not to call witnesses, while Boyle's defence, challenging the accusations, brought Boyle himself to the stand. Boyle's testimony took a dramatic turn as he denied any involvement in Massey's murder, but admitted his presence at the scene of Kinsella's death believing the meeting to be related to a drug transaction. He recounted how, following Kinsella's murder by Fellows, he was handed a revolver, hidden within a sock inside a backpack. This defence was met with scepticism by the prosecution and ultimately failed to convince the jury of his non-complicity. After extensive deliberations, lasting over 31 hours, the jury rendered a guilty verdict for Boyle in connection with Kinsella's murder. While acquitting him of involvement in Massey's death, citing insufficient evidence. Consequently, Boyle was sentenced to life imprisonment with eligibility for parole after 33 years. Fellows, on the other hand, was found guilty on both counts and received a whole life sentence, a rarity in Great Britain, condemning him to spend his remaining days behind bars. Throughout the sentencing, Fellows maintained a smirk, undeterred by the gravity of his fate. The tension peaked as Fellows, being escorted out by the guards, directed a throat-slashing gesture at Boyle, an act that underscored the betrayal felt between the two men. Should Boyle's testimony against Fellows have been an act of genuine betrayal rather than a premeditated plan, it effectively ostracised him from ever safely returning to Salford, branding him a marked man within their tightly-knit criminal underworld. Share your thoughts and feedback in the comments section below. If you found my investigative analysis insightful, please be sure to like this video, share it with your friends and subscribe to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel. Don't forget to hit the bell icon too so you'll get notified each time I release a new video. I appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, stay curious and keep seeking truth.